thank you, everybody. Um, we will sprinkle. Um, I want to thank Chris and Sol, um, who really started Autism Echo for some of the content of this presentation. But um, just talking about medical follow-up, we concentrate so much on diagnosis. Um, I think it's so great to think about what do you do once you make the diagnosis and thinking about the whole child and um, we'll go through some standards that we can adopt. Um, next slide. Or am I controlling? No. So, you know, we just got a glimpse of this with NF1, um, you know, autism, it's always more than autism. You know, it comes with the behavioral developmental things, anxiety, cognitive problems, challenging behaviors, uh, GI problems, um, the irritable autistic child is constipated until proven otherwise, um, you know, seizures, um, sleep problems, apnea, et cetera. So we had to think about all the various different comorbidities that can come with autism. Next slide. And, and as we do this, we are uniquely um, poised to think about the the child exists within a greater family and that changes the dynamics of the family. Mm -hmm. When they interact with the healthcare setting, that can be different for them. It can be different for us. The same thing with the school setting and then in the community as well. So we have to think about the whole child and not just the behaviors. I think, um, you know, recently I had a neuro neurotypical child and the parents were in the room crying because they saw the article about screen time and autism. And they took that to mean increased screen time in infants means they're autistic. And um, they have a five-year-old severely impacted autistic child across the street from them. And that's their, their world of it. So think about the community the child lives in as well. Next slide. So, you know, we want to have family-centered care. We want to make sure we make the diagnosis right with a comprehensive diagnosis. And then we want to, as best we can, within our geographic limitations, have team-based care or coordination of care. Always, always important to share decision-making with families and with the many, um, you know, complementary and alternative medical recommendations for autism that are out there. Shared decision-making um, combined with decision support and education is super, super important. And then longitudinal follow-up um, helps us continue to be that family-focused uh, um, person in that autistic child's um, sphere. So next slide. <clears throat> so as we think about managing autistic children's visits, um, we have to think about it, you know, if you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism and, you know, they're very unique and their needs differ too. Um, you know, ideally, if you can talk to the family before um, the appointment to find out anything you can do to satisfy the child's needs is super good. Also talking to your staff about what the needs of that autistic child are. I remember a time I had a kiddo super serendipitous that I discovered this but it was a simple little head bump with the kid. And then I could do whatever I wanted, ear exam included. If I didn't do the head bump, couldn't listen to the heart, couldn't listen to the lungs, couldn't get them to get on the exam table, couldn't get them to comply with any of the things. So, um, you know, preparing my staff for those things, getting the blood pressure, I taught my staff to, um, you know, uh, head bump with the kid. And every one of us had success once we learned that. Um, you know, I think scheduling an introductory visit, I recall a time when I uh, actually saw a kid in the stairwell of my office. Um, I was on the second floor at the time. I saw him in the stairwell of the office because that was the closest place we could get him to the office. And um, to be my compliance officer with HIPAA, the uncle stood at the top of the stairs and I pity the people that tried to use the stairwell because uncle was very, um, ad very well advocating for this child to have HIPAA security in the stairwell. Um, and so, you know, also we can use and model behavior techniques in the office um, once we get them in that space, um, how we respond um, to the child. I, I was in the hospital today with a autistic sibling of the newborn and um, he was grunting 
uh, continuously and repetitive nature and making attempts to acknowledge me or engage me. And uh, so I, of course, used my best vocabulary and grunted back with him. And um, we had a really great inter uh, interaction between the two of us. So I was modeling to the family, again, like, come to where the child's needs are. Um, and then, you know, I think we can be overwhelmed with all of these different medical issues. So talking about what's the most important topic we can address today and use my favorite item to do any care is the follow-up appointment to cover the other items. Next slide. Um, so again, we talked about continuous longitudinal follow-up. At each visit, we should be assessing the educational supports, um, current therapy supports, uh, assessing behaviors, are we making progress with any of these activities? Um, screening for underlying medical conditions, checking in to see how the family's doing, and then offering resources we have. This sounds a lot like echo autism, doesn't it? <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> Um, so when we think about autism follow-up, think about the frequency and the younger they are, the more important frequent follow-up is. So toddlers and preschoolers, we want to see more often every four months. And then once they're in school, there's so many touch points for that child, people that are interacting with them. Um, we can back off on our surveillance a little bit. So every six to 12 months, however, based on the child, if there's any medication support or um, you know, times of disruption in progress or um, even times where there's too much therapy going on and the child is halting in all of them because they're over therapy uh, engaged. Um, I think that that's important to see them more frequently. And then some major transitions are, you know, to developmental preschool, kindergarten, middle school. Uh, puberty is super hard. If you think about the normal uh, adolescent, um, neurotypical adolescent, they can wake up angry someday and not even know why, and their parents don't know why, and they're fine the next day, and the parents are still kind of like, huh, he was mad yesterday, and he's happy today. We don't get it. Autism can be just as the same, and yet it can be more profound. And then, you know, starting um, high school and then also like start the transition to guardianship and adulthood early, early, early. Next slide. So in our anticipatory guidance, we want to be proactive and help parents and anticipate like what in their storybook may come next, um, whether that be um, the visit to the specialist, kindergarten, um, you know, puberty, middle school. And then again, we talked about that transition to adulthood or guardianship and that really we should start in that 12 to 13 age group and really start hammering at home. The worst thing in the world is to have a child who's autistic, who is 17 and six months and the family's like, well, what do we do when he turns an adult? <laughs> That's super hard to achieve in six months unless you, you have money and connections. So next slide. Um, so every visit, every time, I like to start off with a positive question of what's going well, what has gone well. It sets the tone. Um, you know, we assume a deficit-based approach when we go in asking what the problems are, um, what the needs are, what's going wrong. If we go in with um, what's gone well, what's going well, we can set the tone and, and go to more of a... a you know, a successful approach. Um, <clears throat> every time we want to talk about sleep concerns, um, constipation, again, I think we've seen so many times where irritable autistic child equals constipation till proven otherwise. Um, assess diet every time. It's hard to meet the dietary needs or the nutritional needs of children with limited diets, some often encountered with autistic children. Um, seizures, staring spells, they can be super subtle on a child that doesn't have a lot of facial expressions. So really kind of taking a closer look at that. And then, you know, if there aren't any medicines, we need to be looking at monitoring and with the atypical antipsychotics, looking for body mass index, um, any uh, movement issues that they're having, getting some limited labs, fasting lipids, fasting glucose at baseline, and then six months um, for a bit and then annually. And then with any stimulant therapy, we want to be looking at height and weight velocity, looking at their heart rate and rhythm. And then with alpha-2 agonists, we want to be looking at heart rate and blood pressure regularly. Next visit. Or, I'm sorry, next slide. Um, so topics that we can touch upon um, to support the parents is reviewing the IEP 
504, it's not enough to ask if it exists. Is it being followed? Um, so we have to really make sure that they're following. And so often people, parents have given up because they're not following it, but they don't know that there's resources like their own inner giant or iPool can help out with 504 um, IEP issues in school. Um, what are our client base or, um, supports, um, speech, OTPT? And you know how is the parent perceiving progress? And if they're not perceiving progress, you may in your interval have seen progress. And so we talked about this in the comments. I love that about reframing the expectations. Um, and so, you know, you can talk about progress in a number of different ways, but trying to show the small triumphs is really important. Um, and then, you know, anytime you're hearing a lot of deficits, I think it's great to ask the family, what's the greatest thing about your child or what do you like most about your child? it one changes the tone it builds the child up should they be able to understand that and it resets the parents stress level because there have been deficit 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 their resilience tank is getting empty and we ask what's the coolest thing about your child their resilience tank um, gets filled up a little bit um we are really well uh, you know placed to ask about how the family is doing what about the other siblings um what about the next baby and the neurotypical progression of milestones? Talk about the morning that can happen each time that neurotypical child meets a milestone. And then we can talk about resources within the community. And I love this community that we have where everyone's popping up with, hey, did you know this exists? And does that exist? That's our job is to collect as many resources as we can. And then there's always simple resources that are always available, like Autism Speaks, AAP has a ton of, issue, uh, of effective resources for parents with autism children as well. Um, next slide. And then, you know, not to be forgotten, respite and self-care discussions, they should happen at every visit. Um, what have you done lately for you, I think is such an important question. And, um, you know, everyone's heard me say the self-care is not selfish care, and that doesn't come from me. It comes from a colleague of mine's patient um, who has a child who's completely dependent, dependent as an adult, and that mom still takes time for self-care every day. Um, next slide. And before I talk about this, I can't believe I left out something but I can. Um, safety should be discussed at every um, visit. And like with Brittany's child loves water, but is the child water safe? And so um, your elopers, your wanderers really check about safety, locks up high. Can they swim? Is If they're getting swimming lessons, are the swimming lessons done while in clothes? Because it's very rare that children elope just when in a swimsuit. So safety should be addressed at each of the visits as well. Um, this is a, a resource that I got from NIH um, and um, it's an overwhelming follow-up uh, of autism checklist. I love it though. We'll go through each of these bullet points um, separately in the coming slides. Next slide. <clears throat> so we talked about a little bit about this, um, you know, have we done ideologic testing for associated medical um, conditions? Um, you know, do a full physical and neurologic exam? Has hearing assessment been done? Was it satisfying? Was it, you know, satisfying the needs of the child to say yes or no? Um, do we need to do vision assessment, dental care, um, genetic testing um, when it's indicated, and then metabolic testing when it's indicated? Next slide. So as we're thinking about comorbid conditions, do we need referral sources? Do we need to get them to the GI doc? Do we need to send them to a nutritionist? Do we need to get sleep involved, sleep study, et cetera? Do we need to manage anxiety, depression with you know medicines? Are they at a point where they could adapt with some um, you know, counseling therapy if they're advanced verbally, um, you know, manage ADHD and then other child specific conditions. Next slide. So um, what are other assessments and therapies that address the um, functional challenges that kids with autism have? You know, are they getting speech language therapy? Um, 
psychoeducational assessment, occupational therapy, do they need physical therapy for their safety or success? And then um, again, we talked about individual educational supports. Next slide. Um, and then moving on to behavioral and developmental interventions um, for the core features of autism. And, you know, this is where our job is to become familiar with available community programs, um, provide information about essential components and effectiveness of various different treatments and interventions. Um, you know, some people, and I'm finding ABA amongst the younger parents, they don't know about the history of ABA. So they're not, um, they don't have the same preconceived notion an older parent may have about ABA, having heard about it um, in its early days. And then, you know, facilitate enrollment into behavioral and developmental interventions, um, you know, home supports, um, all kinds of things um, to help support that neurodevelopment in the child. Next slide. And then challenging behaviors, you know, what is the most challenging behavior? What can we do to change that for you? Um, reframe um, what the child might be telling the parent with that behavior. Um, reframe how the child may, or the parent may respond to that um, behavior. Um, and then, you know, talk about supports that we may have, um, first or second line treatments, and then refer for, for parent training. I think Julie is always the one to point out that we should be referring for parent training. And so I think it's just really great. You are now blessed with a child with autism, like become a autism expert. And most of our families do. Next slide. I, by the way, gained most of my knowledge about autism from my families uh, when I started in medicine right after residency. Um, so, um, and then this is one that is really difficult, complementary alternative medicine approaches. There's some 210 different therapies out there for autism. Parents will try a number of them the first year of diagnosis. Our job is to become familiar with them um, as much as we can and uh, one inquire, are they pursuing these therapies? And then to provide education about what we know about the effectiveness of them or the inherent dangers of them. Next slide. And then, you know, this is moving on to supporting the family, you know, educational resources, um, local community resources, information about in-home supports or interventions can really make it easier because going out with an autistic child, for instance, that has to go through the door, you know, 15 times before they'll actually go through the door, going out can be very difficult. Um, you know, family and sibling support, um, I didn't know about this, about the disability tax credit, um, but that is something to that I need to educate myself about and explore more. And then again, we talked about, you know, trying to develop your own um, playlist of local services and educational programs that are available. And then share as much as you can with um, schools or developmental preschool, the speech therapist, get letters of, or, um, uh, you know, authorization to communicate with those other providers, the more people giving input to your management of that child with autism, the more complete your management will be. And honestly, the easier it is when you have, um, you know, a speech therapist that's willing to talk to you. And I know speech therapists are willing to talk to you. So it's really on us as the providers to be willing to talk to the speech therapist, but we can get a robust amount of information um, from the the different um, faculties that are involved. Um, next slide. So just thinking about some additional tips and tricks, you know, engage the child on their terms, like me grunting with a child today that I just met yesterday. Um, you know, that child is going to now come see me in the office because the parents saw that interaction and they are going to transfer care to me um, because I engage the child at their level, um, you know, um, kind of try to figure out what they do in their other environments, school or with other family members, other friends, um, you know, also like, you know, try to talk about what your favorite part of the day is, if they're verbal, if not, ask the parent what their favorite part of the day is. Again, changing the mindset to focus on the positive. Um, and then always, you know, partnering with the family, shared decision-making is how we should be doing this. 
education doctor means educator. So we should really be educating so that shared decision making um, provides education enough that the family can make a good decision within their you know moral and personal beliefs. Um, and, you know, we talked about this, the morning that can happen with the next child when they meet their milestones on time. And then always kind of what are the questions do you have? What can we address next time is an important thing. Next slide. And then, you know, documentation for your record, at least once in your chart, put down what the DSM-5 interview was, what um, behavioral observations you made um, that support your diagnosis, any of the developmental screeners that were used, um, document it at least once um, in the chart that's easily accessible. So you can always go there or a provider that's seeing them, that's not you can go there and see, okay, this is what was done. Um, and then in your assessment plan, important to outline what your recommendations are um, for the child, what follow-ups are needed, and always share this with the family. And um, sharing it with the family allows them to gain access to some therapies or resources that they may otherwise be excluded from without this documentation. So next slide. Um, and then just references. I don't know, I recently um, purchased this from the AAP. It's an incredible, incredible toolkit. Um, you can get it not being an AAP member. You get a discount if you're an AAP member, but an incredible toolkit. And then this is that article that was in Pediatric Child Health in 2019 where that checklist resides, and I want to give credit to them. Um, it was a free access article, so I had the ability to share it with you. Um, and I'd love to answer any questions. I don't know what time it is. Oh, we have time, eight minutes. So if I can talk about medical follow-up in 15, 20 minutes, you can do a visit in 20 minutes, right? So Tom, we still have um, a lockdown. <laughs> Please just raise your hand. We'll unmute you or just put it in the chat. And thanks, Amy, for those additional resources as well. Yeah, I see that Lucy Collins was asking about guidance on genetic testing, and I don't know if Amy um, or um, Tim might be able to um, add some. I tend to think about it when um, I need further clarification or there's a specific dysmorphism or other constellation of syndromic features. I tend to go for um, genetic testing in those situations, and I may use it less because it's very expensive and, and difficult to do sometimes. Yeah, I can comment. I mean, I agree with what Elena said, especially with children with global developmental intellectual disability um, and autism. I, I, I always discuss it with families and I leave it up to them if they would like to move forward with genetic testing. Um, we have a whole lecture coming up as Lindsay mentioned in the chat. Um, so they are definitely the experts, but, um, but I do at least give parents the option of doing it and discuss kind of the, the risks and benefits of doing it, um, and, uh, the possible outcomes. Um, I think it's really important because families need to have informed consent. Um, so, um, I, I actually have a smart phrase that lists kind of all of the possible outcomes for families. And I discuss it with them ahead of time. I recommend, um, if you do move forward with genetic testing, I've done, I've used in Vitae before, but we actually separated from in Vitae about a year and a half ago, cause they had some lab issues and there was like a pause in testing. Um, we use gene DX right now. Um, and, um, we've had pretty good success with that. I, I recommend getting prior authorizations first because it is expensive as Tom said. And, um, sometimes I have families get, uh, Katie Beckett, um, to start and then we'll do the genetic testing. Great. Thank you, Amy. Travis. Um, excellent talk. Dr. Patterson, I appreciate that. The the I had a few things. I think when with the physician and uh, working with patients of yours, that I think as as follow up care and looking at pediatricians and focusing on the positives and focusing on what the parents are doing well, as well as what the parents can do versus what they should not be doing or to not do, it, is a uh, an amazing way to. Add, provide confidence as well as gain progress versus focusing on those 
kind of more of the uh, potential negative. Um, and, you know, some of that's pretty basic. You can, you know, just identify like, you know, descriptions and, and uh, phrases that are specific to what they're doing well um, versus the focus on some of those negatives. And um, yeah, I, I think that stands out to me in your talk today. And I've had experience from both your patients as well as some of the other providers on on our cohort too that um, have really appreciated that portion and that that focus um, when we think of other PCPs and learning around this topic. Yeah, we we often have to give um, people a care to to dig out the deficits to get them thinking of it the way we do um, as it applies to autism. But the moment you ask your family, like, can you tell me what you love about your kid? I mean, it's just like rapid fire. I feel like I'm in front of a Gatling gun with positive statements about their child coming. And I mean, I'm so overwhelmed with the uh, ease of which autistic family, you know, autistic children's families talk about what they love about that person in their family. And so I just think that's an incredible way that we can also change the focus. You know, what's the coolest thing? And I do that after the DSM-5 interview always, because the DSM-5 interview, do they do this, which the parent is hearing, they don't do this, they don't do this, they don't do this, they don't do this. But then I ask, you know, what do they do well? What do they, what do you like? And they're able to come up with a lot of things. Other questions? Um, I, I would thank you for that presentation. That was so awesome. I I think the comment I would I would make is the 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 disappointment that many parents feel when their 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 young children enter into the school uh, age three to three and on, uh, because it seems like there are so many excellent caring individuals to support and invest in in, in kids that are really young. Um, and the parents almost assume that when their kids enter uh, a, re a regular school environment that's driven by lo laws rather and definitions rather than empathy and and uh, and um, and so on, that they it almost changes from uh, uh, won't somebody please help me help my baby to why won't they help me help my baby? And so advocacy is so important. Um, and it, it's not every visit, but uh, and and so ma many of the times I think that parents have so much on their plates that they're emotionally exhausted trying to organize and sustain care. Uh, and they and and brains don't turn off. How, what else can I do? What else can we do? What's next? Um, that there's very little uh, energy left for another assignment to learn how to become a strong advocate. So uh, I would definitely use iPoll. Um, definitely, I think we, we have in, in Idaho, uh, Disability Rights Idaho, which is a federally funded agency that has attorneys on their staff and, and, uh, and uh, coordinators and so on that will investigate a concern and see if it has any legal basis, uh, but also then uh, recommending the book by the, by the rights of Pete and Pam Wright called From Emotions to Advocacy. It, it's. Uh, I found that that not every parent is quite ready in a motivational readiness kind of framework to really do the homework to become a strong advocate. But I think eventually, what we what we desire for families is that they recognize the uniqueness of their kids. They're an expert in their kids, uh, and learn how to become a strong advocate with health systems, educational systems especially. Uh, and and not from an adversarial standpoint, but just know that that they have rights and they have our rights and they have our support for taking that journey to become a strong advocate. And uh, I, I think that can that can help them feel a sense of satisfaction and 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 uh, when they're dealing with the schools and know that when the school is going no 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 they have they have the next step that they can take, even if it means coming down to the use of the courts. And, and that's how a lot of a lot of the our understanding of the rights of of individuals with disability have been defined over the last fifty years, is through people who have said, "I'm not going to stop there. That's this is not right. This is not just." 
and trying to prevent some of the injustices to kids with individuals with disability that have occurred. I am going to wrap us up today. Um, from the ECHO team, I just really appreciate your grace and um, understanding. Today was really hard. Um, so thank you. The ECHO team will be debriefing afterwards on our continuous quality improvement. So thank you for all of that and being here today. Um, we hope to see you in two weeks. Um, our next session will be February 8th from 1230 to 130. So a shorter time frame for our next uh, meeting. Our QI cohort will have a meeting or a, a, a meeting following the next um, session. The topic is navigating individualized education plans or IEPs for autistic children and strategies for effective support. Our presenter will be Julie Mead. She is the Chief Officer of Special Services at the Caldwell School District. So we look forward to seeing all of you um, on February 8th. Thank you so much. Take care.